another patient with aortic stenosis, and uh, he had dyspnea, he also had uh, peripheral vascular disease with claudication, and, and uh, so you can see that this was the examination when he presented to us, and he had an examination that fit with uh, severe aortic stenosis in terms of his carotids and decreased A2 and the murmur. Uh, his electrocardiogram, he's in sinus rhythm, unlike the uh, previous patient. And you can see he's got low anterior forces there, left, little left axis. Tortuous aorta with some plaque in it, and uh, not, nothing remarkable there. So we'll look at his echo. So this is peristernal long and then peristernal short at mid-level. This other one should play. Apical short. So here's an apical four chamber, an apical long axis, apical two chamber, and his ejection fraction was calculated as 65%. To me, it looks more than that, but it's at least 65%. Of course, we always try to measure the aorta if we can in patients with aortic stenosis. His ascending aorta was normal up to the level we could see there, proximal mid-level. Here's a close-up of his aortic valve in long axis. He didn't have much aortic regurge, didn't have much mitral regurge. There's a close-up in short axis, so it's heavily calcified. And this is actually short axis from subcostal, which is the alternative window we can use to look at the aortic valve. And I must say our sonographers have gotten very good at doing that uh, when we're looking for bicuspid versus tricuspid valves. Uh, and then here's an apical with the color flow again showing not much AR or MR. And then we're doing our PW Doppler, putting the sample volume a little bit toward the apex from the valve. And uh, he ended up having a stroke volume of 74. And his stroke volume index is not dramatically good, but it's 38, so it's above the cutoff. He did have mitral annular calcification that I didn't point out, and so he's got a little bit of mitral stenosis, mean gradient of six. We're seeing this increasingly in these patients that uh, have this degree of aortic stenosis at the, this age. Notice a little isovolumic flow there too, which is just kind of interesting. So his mean gradient was, uh, the CW was uh, from the apex here, you can see he had a mean gradient of 38, and the, that gave a TVI of 88. And then there's right parasternal where he's got 40 millimeters of mercury and TVI of 85. And then we go to the suprasternal notch and he's got a mean gradient of 50, TVI of 110. And so as with all patients with aortic stenosis, in order to avoid the angle theta error with the Doppler, we have to be sure we line up with the jet, and the only way we can do that these days is, is still is to go to all the transducer positions. So we've got apical, uh, we've got the right parasternal. We didn't get much from right supracavicular, but from suprasternal we got 50. So let me just go back, take a quick look at that slide at the numbers there. And the question is, what is his mean gradient across the valve? Is it 36? Is it 40? Is it 50? Or is it indeterminate? So 71% say 50 and uh, 40 is 13 percent. Well, actually, if we look at this signal up here with the 50 millimeter mercury, that gave a TVI of 110, and his valve area would be 0.67 as opposed to 0 0.87, 0 0.84 with these other two areas. But what you notice about the signal, he has severe stenosis of an arch vessel, and that's what's giving this signal. And the important clue to that is the diastolic forward flow. You can't have diastolic forward flow across the aortic valve because it closes, right? So this is characteristic of a severe uh, vessel stenosis, and if we're in suprasternal notch, then it's probably an arch vessel that's stenotic, and it's just one of the pitfalls. He still had severe aortic stenosis from the other positions, but we would have o overestimated the severity had we not recognized this. Uh, the other thing is if you go about it, you can calculate the... Um, the acceleration time, and the acceleration time will be different. It'll be longer for the vascular stenosis than for the aortic stenosis. It's another clue. Uh, and so we tried, to, we just went up to the suprasternal notch to see what we could see, and it looked like there was something narrowed here, 
one of the vessels and not a lot of aliasing, but uh, we reported, we ignored that, that uh, other main gradient, reported the 40 in the valve area that was associated with it, still called it severe, and then we sent him off to cardiac CT scan again. He's going into a workup for a transcatheter valve, and so he gets uh, cardiac CT anyway. And in addition to the findings, he's got a very high calcium score, as you can see. Uh, but he was found to have severe stenosis in his proximal brachiocephalic artery and in the right carotid bifurcation in the left, and the left uh, subclavian artery. Here's the one shot that I took uh, that just demonstrates heavy calcium in the valve from the CT. And then if we look at the brachiocephalic artery here, it's severely stenotic. And uh, if you look at the chest here, the chest is superimposed here, there's the suprasternal notch right there, and there's the stenosis that we were seeing. So it, it makes sense that that's, that's what that was. So we went on to have coronary angiography. Unfortunately, uh, had severe disease, including left main. And uh, he was seen by uh, one of our surgeons who didn't think he was a good candidate at that point because of uh, he had really heavy calcification of his aorta, which would be difficult to cross clamp bulky LBOT, he had all these stenoses, and he was, uh, actually he's, he's being observed right now as the decision made in the valve clinic uh, because of difficulty accessing. And I don't know, Hart, so one, uh, that's, that's the outcome so far. I was really putting the case in to show this pitfall, which is relatively uh, uncommon, but uh, the, the pitfall, if it's in the right supraclavicular position that you get it, it can be the subclavian artery. Uh, or the carotid, uh, or the brachiocephalic. Here it's usually a brachiocephalic artery. Uh, but uh, Hartzell, would he be a where you could consider doing the apical aortic conduit if he's? Yeah, that, that's a good point, uh, Buzz, and a good idea. The apical aortic conduit used to be a bailout for patients that had ascending aortic problems and severe aortic stenosis. Nowadays, those patients are managed with TAVR, but there are still a few indications. I think this might be one, yeah. Really, just uh, had, uh, just, just to, to give Jerry, uh, he, he looked at uh, the gradients from various positions. So 51%, Jeremy, from right para, that's your default window. So that's right. in many ways, right para, it's your go-to. Yeah, it's interesting. When I started my career, it was, it was just the opposite. Apex was the majority. And I think we think what's happened now is as patients get older, you get that angulation between the ventricle and the aorta. And now all of a sudden, right parasternal becomes the most common window for the highest velocity. It's just interesting uh, evolution.